Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation, Toxicology Pearls for Attorneys. I'm Rudy Lehrer of Lehrer Law in Beverly Hills. I will be moderating today's webinar. Today's session is being co-sponsored by the Beverly Hills Bar Litigation and Family Law Sections. Ron Reinstein and Kerry Holmes are co-chairs of the Family Law Section. Hillary Johns is chair of our Litigation Section. Today's session is also being made possible by the following sponsors. Soberlink, White Zuckerman, and our family wizard. Now let me introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Allison Muller. Dr. Muller runs Acri Muller Consulting outside of Philadelphia. Dr. Muller is a board certified toxicologist and registered pharmacist with over 20 years experience in the field of clinical toxicology. The majority of Dr. Muller's 20 plus year career in toxicology was with the Poison Control Center at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. While there, she was consulted on the care of poison patients within 21 counties in Pennsylvania and all of Delaware. Dr. Muller is presently an independent consultant with experience as an expert witness in cases involving alcohol, drugs of abuse, carbon monoxide, and medication errors, and in postmortem toxicology. Adding to her background, Dr. Muller is also on faculty at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. There, she teaches toxic excuse me, there she teaches toxicology to second year veterinary medicine students. Now, if time permits at the end of our session, Dr. Muller will be happy to take a few questions. Please send your questions in the Q&A directed to panelists. We will also check the chat section. And with that, Dr. Muller, let's begin. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for having me present today. So toxicology pearls for attorneys is what I like to call a bread and butter talk. And I speak to attorneys all over the country with the intent of teaching just enough toxicology to really help attorneys with their drug related and alcohol related cases. I, as an expert witness, work on cases that also involve chemicals and environmental toxins. But those aren't the categories that attorneys are typically encountering in day-to-day -day cases. There may be cases that involve drug and alcohol that come up surprisingly. It might not be a straight drug case, but then there, there tends to be drugs that have been in someone's system following an accident or an injury. So the learning objectives today focus on questions that I've received from attorneys. If I was giving this talk to fellow toxicologists or um, other healthcare or medical professionals, there would be a much different set of learning objectives. But over time, I've paid close attention to the questions that attorneys have asked me that are very toxicology specific. So my goal for today's program is that you take at least one pearl from toxicology pearls today. So many of these topics that I'm going to go over today could be one hour programs by themselves. So these topics are given at a very high level and just to give you a lay of the land, I have uh, other topics that I present in more detail such as opioids or on marijuana or synthetic cannabinoids or postmortem toxicology, but these are just highlights. And it could be in any practice area. So for example, for family attorneys, questions I usually get from family attorneys have to do with a few of these learning objectives, especially about false positives and common effects on the body from what I consider to be common uh, street and prescription drugs. 
So just to give you a basis for what we're going to review today together uh, this afternoon, I want to start with some definitions, which might be a little bit dry, but you'll see how things will all connect and unfold as we go through today's presentation over the next 50 to 60 minutes. So a metabolite is a breakdown product of a drug. So the drug enters the body and then the liver typically metabolizes a drug, meaning it breaks it down into additional components. And those components known as metabolites might be active, meaning they actually do something, so they have pharmacologic activity, or they may be inactive, meaning <clears throat> they don't do anything to the body. They still exist in the body, we can still measure them, but they're not actually having an effect on the patient. And metabolites may actually be more potent than the parent drug, meaning they may have more of an effect on the person than the actual parent drug. It's really drug specific. I bring up the term metabolite because we are going to be circling back to that term when we talk more about drug screens and drug tests. Notice I differentiated that there's two different um, sets of nomenclature, drug screening and drug testing. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind because we'll come back to that and I'll tell you why that's important for you to understand as attorneys. Many of those drug screens or drug tests are not even looking for parent drugs. They're looking for metabolites. Then there's detection time. That's a common question I get as a toxicologist, not only from attorneys, but just from people in general. Oh, if I use this drug, for how long is it going to be able to be picked up on a drug screen or a drug test? Um, that's going to vary with not only the type of test that is being performed, but the amount of drug that was used and the frequency of use. Um, an example that is a common question is detection time for marijuana and its metabolites. You know, the, the big reason for the variation in how long marijuana its metabolites are detected, particularly one metabolite in question, um, it's no, you'll see it as THC COOH. Um, THC, CU, carboxy, THC, there's all different ways to say the same thing, if only all laboratories gave the same terminology. Um, that metabolite will show up even a month after somebody has stopped using marijuana if they were a chronic marijuana user. Now, detection time in somebody who uses marijuana at a party on Saturday night and just does it once in a while, well, you know, they'll be clear within a few days. And then finally, route of administration. Uh, route of administration is quite simply how a drug is getting into the body. Is it going to be the most convenient way and that's by mouth or is it intranasally uh, in the nose? Is it through the eyes? Is it through the veins, intravenously, intramuscularly? So route of administration is simply how a drug will get into the body. And some drugs are inactivated if they're not given in a certain uh, route of administration. For example, um, if somebody needs insulin for their diabetes, why is it that they have to take those inconvenient subcutaneous, meaning under the skin shots for their insulin, at least at this point, um, because it'll be the insulin if it's taken by mouth would be inactivated um, when it is swallowed. So then get the person would get no benefit from that drug. So pharmacokinetics is a rather complicated area of science, but I'm going to give you the highlights to help you understand, especially drug testing and detection time. So pharmacokinetics is what the body does to a drug. Drug comes into the body by some route of administration, right, I gave you some examples of that, and then what happens? What does the body do to that drug? That's pharmacokinetics. So between my undergraduate program and my graduate program, I took three semesters of pharmacokinetics. So I was kind of, you know, at my max for pharmacokinetics, but yours will only be for a, a few slides. And there was a lot of calculations for pharmacokinetics, a lot of graphs, a lot of modeling. I'm just going to show you only one graph to give you an important take home point, I promise. So pharmacokinetics, the first process is absorption. Drug enters the body, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And how quickly a drug absorbs is going to vary with how much drug 
has been presented and also the route of administration. Um, you know, some drugs are absorbed better than others, you know, in terms of oral route or intravenous route. You know, intravenous route is obviously one of the fastest routes, goes directly into the bloodstream. Um, a question I get about absorption a lot involves alcohol, and alcohol is a drug. And so I'll get the question about alcohol. Okay, what affects the absorption of alcohol? So the first thing that probably comes to your mind is the presence of food in the stomach and how food in the stomach affects the absorption of alcohol. And I'm gonna take a minute just to explain why food on the stomach actually affects the absorption of alcohol, meaning how long it takes for the alcohol to go into the bloodstream because nothing ha nothing's happening to the person with alcohol unless it gets into the bloodstream. If it just sits in the stomach, nothing's happening in terms of, you know, any intoxication. So most of the absorption of alcohol is actually not taking place in the stomach. It's taking place in the small intestine. So any factors that prevent alcohol from quickly moving from the stomach into the small intestine affects its absorption. So if there's a high fat, high protein, good sized meal sitting in the stomach, alcohol is not going to just fly into the small intestine and then get into the bloodstream and then go to the various organs, including the brain and cause intoxication. Other things that can kind of slow down absorption other than food for, for alcohol would be, you know, a high sugar drink. It's almost like a dessert. You know, if somebody has, you know, a very sweet cocktail, that's almost like having a snack with your, with your alcohol. You picture it that way. But this is not a talk on alcohols. I do a talk specifically on alcohol, but I wanted to give you that highlight for absorption since that's something that will be important for you in cases. Okay, so the drug's absorbed, meaning it's in the bloodstream. Now what's happening to it? It's going all around the body. It's distributing. And drugs don't just go where we want them to go. That's how we end up having side effects. In other words, if I take, let's say, ibuprofen for uh, a headache, right? The ibuprofen doesn't just go into the bloodstream and go to the site of the pain in my head. It's going all over. It's going to my stomach. Do I want it there? No. That's how there's issues with ibuprofen and similar drugs causing um, gastric distress, upset stomach, gastrointestinal bleeding, or going to the kidneys. And they can affect those types of drugs like ibuprofen can affect kidney blood flow or to the heart. They can cause adverse effects on the heart. So the bloodstream is taking the drugs all over the body. That's an important point to know because just because a drug is meant to work in a certain location doesn't mean that's the only location it is distributed to. Metabolism, you're already experts on what metabolism is because we talked about what a metabolite is. So metabolism is the process which uh, primarily is occurring in the liver, it's breaking down a drug into metabolites. And then finally, elimination, and this is where we have our only graph for today. And I'm oversimplifying this concept somewhat, but it's to really illustrate a point for you. So there is essentially two types of pharmacokinetics when we talk about elimination. First order elimination versus zero order elimination. Now, if you see this graph, concentration versus time, alcohol undergoes elimination via zero, elim zero order elimination, meaning it's a fixed rate. So if somebody's eliminating alcohol, their fixed rate is, let's say, 15 milligrams per deciliter per hour. There's nothing that we can do to hit the gas pedal and get them to eliminate it faster. Coffee? No. More snacks? No. They're going to eliminate it at that same rate. More alcohol, less alcohol? No, it's not changing. Hence, you see the dotted line for zero order elimination, that is our example of alcohol, is a straight line concentrating ver concentration versus time. It is a fixed rate. Most drugs undergo first order elimination, meaning it's not a linear rate. The rate is changing. The concentration versus time graph is a curve because that elimination rate is changing with various factors. What the take home point of this graph is, now again, I'm oversimplifying this, but it's an important point. 
if we have a given alcohol level at a given point in time, so we can plot it on a concentration versus time graph, and we can estimate what the person's elimination rate is, we can get a retrospective calculation done for an alcohol level. Is it going to be dead on? No, it is not. You get a little bit of a range, you do. Most ideal is if you have more than one alcohol level to plot, so you're not just estimating what somebody's elimination rate is. You know, if you have at least two concentrations and time values that you can plot on such a graph, then we have a, a good idea what the person's elimination rate is as opposed to saying, oh, they el eliminate at 25 milligrams per deciliter per hour because they're a chronic drinker or they're an occasional drinker. So maybe they're somewhere around, you know, 12 to 15 milligrams per deciliter per hour or they never drink. So they're 10. So that's just an estimation. That being said, if you have a drug level, then what are you going to do? And that's a question I get so frequently. Okay, we have a drug level that was done at the hospital, but the incident in question was three hours ago. What was your drug level three hours ago? Well, you could see therein lies the problem. We don't know what rate they're eliminating because it's constantly changing. So being able to do that from a retrospective calculation is very difficult. All right, so if pharmacokinetics is what the body does to a drug, pharmacodynamics is the opposite. Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. What does it do? It does good things, it does bad things. It's a very simplistic dichotomy of what is happening in pharmacodynamics. For attorneys, I talk about pharmacodynamics all the time without even um, labeling it as such. When I have discussions with attorneys about what did this drug do to this driver, to this person that was supposed to be, um, you know, fully aware, being able to do divided tasks, have clear cognition because they were, you know, working with heavy machinery or they were, they were at a particular job site or they were, um, you know, interacting with young children, whatever the case may be. What did that drug do to their fill in the blank here, behavior, balance, um, you know, able to make decisions, et cetera? So that's really what you're asking me then. You're asking me the pharmacodynamics of a drug. Now, why can't we just look this up in a book? Okay, so we want to know what the pharmacodynamics of a drug was on a given person. We can look it up in a book, you know, but you see when you look up what the effects of drugs are, I mean, you have everything from A to Z. It really is a very patient specific thing. And why is that? Well, besides the fact we're all unique, but we'd like to think that in medically we really are because not everybody's on the same drugs, right? There's drug interaction. So some drugs may intensify the effects of others, slow down the rate of metabolism of others or speed it up. Um, also, people have different medical conditions. There's an issue of age, you know, the very old or the very young, even genetics, something we are getting better at being able to actually measure and predict how people with certain um, genetic enzymes or genetic predispositions will react to drugs. So there's many individual factors. And that's why when I have cases that involve drugs, you know, of course, I want the, you know, the matter at hand, the, you know, hospitalization records, uh, you know, are surrounding the incident in question, whether it be, you know, the medication error or, you know, adverse effect of a drug or impairment case. But that's why I ask for past medical and past pharmacy records, because that tells me more about that person's makeup, about how I would expect that person to respond to a drug, react to a drug? Are they more sensitive, less sensitive? What exactly would I expect to see with that? So toxicology testing can be done on all different types of body fluids and body related substances. And so the question I'll get is which one is the most accurate? Well, it depends. And I probably hear that a lot from scientific and medical experts, but it really does depend. I try and to give you the, what I feel are the pluses and minuses of each of these sources for testing. So we'll start with urine. The good thing about do it using urine for toxicology testing is that 
the detection time is longer. Why is that? Because drugs will stay in the bloodstream for only so long, right? As they're going through the pharmacokinetic process, right? They've already been absorbed. They've already been distributed, right? They're breaking down. They're being metabolized. They're being eliminated. Well, once they're being eliminated, to some extent, we're going to find them in the urine, and we're, it's going to be sticking around there at the later point, right? Because the first place for the drug to disappear from is the blood. So that's why urine can be helpful because we have a detection time that is later um, for drugs and especially for their metabolites. However, urine testing could be subject to adulteration, meaning you know somebody could try and throw the test. And I've heard many different methods, all with varying levels of success. You know, people trying to drink, you know, an intense amount of water before they're, they're given a um, urine drug test or taking different supplements. You know, they do this research on the internet, see if any supplements can throw the test or um, they'll bring someone else's urine to the, to the tests. You know, the people really, really are trying. It's, uh, this is why we measure like the temperature of the urine, the pH, et cetera, too, to see, wait a second, if, you know, this is this person's urine that was just given for the test, it should be at a certain temperature and not, not, not any colder. And then there's also artificial urine that could be purchased on the internet. Actually, an attorney brought that to my attention. It's fascinating. Um, and so, when we have urine testing, you may see an abbreviation on the toxicology analysis sheet, the laboratory results from the hospital, et cetera, the abbreviation UDS, which means urine drug screen. And so it's here that I will make the distinction between a drug screen and a drug test, as I uh, told you that that would be coming up, and that's a very important point for you as attorneys to understand. So a drug screen is looking for drugs with similar structures. And there are drugs that have nothing to do with one another that have some structural similarities. You know, it only takes, you know, one small change in a structure to have a completely different drug, right? But these drug screens are only looking for these similar structures. That being said, drug screens are subject to false positives. One of the most common false positives, in my opinion, is for PCP. So you may know it as fencyclidine or angel dust. The reason is PCP has a structure that is similar to drugs such as there's an anti-seizure drug, lamotrigine, uh, dextromethorphan, which is an over-the-counter cough suppressant, DM, for example. So those are just two examples. And so somebody who, you know, ends up using um, a seizure drug, with the legitimate use, an anti-seizure drug, comes up positive for PCP, and then questions are asked. Well, how do we know that it's a false positive? That's where a confirmatory test comes in. A confirmatory test is not looking for drugs with similar structures. Confirmatory tests are looking for the molecular fingerprint of a drug. Now, unfortunately, you and I are coming into this years later. So it's not like, you know, I'm the toxicologist on call and I'm dealing with the case in real time as a consultant. And, you know, we can, I can talk to the care team about the you know, usefulness of confirmatory testing from a toxicology standpoint in terms of, you know, clinical picture and clinical plan. We're years later. So if there is no confirmatory test done, then we don't know if it's true positive or not, especially with something like PCP where it is a frequently false positive. Now, how do you know you're looking at a screen or a confirmatory test result? Well, if it says UDS, you know it's a screen. But if it's, let's say, something that um, uses the abbreviation GCMS, so gas chromatography mass spectrometry, that's one common example of a confirmatory test. There's no false positives with confirmatory tests. Moving on to blood testing. So blood testing can have a high degree of accuracy and we don't worry about, you know, the, the risk of, um, you know, someone trying to throw the results of blood testing, but we do have that shorter detection time. 
One thing I want to point out when it comes to blood testing, and I'm going to bring up alcohol again, just because alcohol tends to come up a lot in my conversations with attorneys. And again, it is a drug. When you are looking at blood alcohol levels, make sure you're actually looking at whole blood alcohol levels. And sometimes this is not totally clear, but I'll give you a little tip of when you really should start asking more questions. Because sometimes there'll be measurements of serum alcohol levels. Serum is only a portion of whole blood. All of those numbers that we're familiar with in terms of driving under the influence are whole blood alcohol levels. Serum alcohol levels, again, it's just a portion of the blood, serum alcohol levels will be about 15% higher than whole blood alcohol levels. So you can't take a serum alcohol level and apply it to the numbers for a DUI. You need to convert it to a whole blood alcohol level. So how do you know if it's a serum alcohol level? It may say it very clearly, or it may not. If it says, you know, blood alcohol testing results and it's from a hospital, a lot of times hospitals are testing the serum, not the whole blood, and that's the number they're giving you. So a quick call to the laboratory can clarify that if you're not sure about that. Um, then we have hair testing. Hair testing um, gives us a longer detection time, um, you know, and, you know, there's not a whole lot of drugs that have, um, you know, hair levels that can actually tell us the story that we want to know. It can tell us if someone used drugs, that part of the story it can tell us. Um, it can tell us which drugs were used, provided we know what we're looking for to begin with. Um, when were the drugs used? That's a more complicated uh, feat is to figure out when the drugs were used and figuring out how much, the drug, how much drugs were used in terms of quantity. That's hard for all of these sources. And that's a common question that we all want to know is how much of the drug was used and when. It's not always something that's easy to answer. It's not based solely on the analytical results. And hair testing comes into play when we just want to know from a historical basis what drugs have been used. It's not something that you know, we find out that somebody used yesterday, you know, it's more of telling us, you know, a timeline in general terms of somebody's pattern and uh, use of drugs. And then breath testing. So we have, you know, lots of science to explain how we are able to convert breath alcohol levels to whole blood alcohol levels. And most recently, and it should be very soon, a breathalyzer test or a breath testing device for marijuana impairment. Now that's a little tricky and I, I haven't seen all the science for that yet. Um, this product should be launched very shortly. In fact, I was expecting it last month, but the premise for a um, breath testing device for marijuana impairment is that if marijuana is, the parent compound, is detected in breath within three hours, then the, the studies that that particular company has conducted show that the person would have been impaired. So there's a whole other bit of science in terms of the correlation or really non-correlation between marijuana levels and marijuana metabolite levels in other sources, meaning in blood and in urine, but in breath, they're saying that within three hours, then that correlates with impairment. So more on that later, but not available yet for use. Oh, and I want to get to saliva. So saliva testing I skipped over because I don't know the last time that it was ever presented with saliva testing results. Uh, there are assays that can test saliva for drugs. Again, even less data on drugs and correlation with effects on the body um, when it comes to drugs in, found in saliva. So for drug impairment, and for this, we're going to take alcohol out of the equation. We're going to say that when we're talking about drug impairment, we're, we're talking about drugs other than alcohol. And especially when it comes to impaired driving, the analysis from a toxicology standpoint on its own is a great start, but it's not enough to tell the whole story in my opinion. 
So I like to say that I am, you know, the Nancy Drew of toxicologists, right? So you ask me a question about was this person impaired while driving based on these drug testing results, you know, confirmatory testing, we have levels, et cetera. I need more than just the toxicology results. Give me everything that you have, and attorneys do. They have signs and symptoms, meaning they have bystander reports, they have police reports at the scene. They, you know, if you also can get me past medical records, what else are these, the, the patients, uh, the person in question taking? What medical problems do they have? So it's really the intersection of a lot of different data points to be able to come to the conclusion if somebody, if there's enough evidence to say that somebody was impaired following the use of drugs. Because remember, I alluded to the fact that it's very difficult to tell what somebody's drug level was retrospectively. Therefore, just being able to take a drug level and, and, and then looking at the time a few hours earlier, let's say when an accident was or a traffic stop was, we're not going to be able to get what that level is. So we can't just use the level in isolation because we're not going to be able to find out what that level even was. And for many drugs, again, we're taking alcohol out of the equation, for many drugs, a level is not enough to tell you if there was impairment because there's something called, this is one of many reasons, but there's something called tolerance, right? And especially with drugs, let's say with opioids, I get a lot of opioid related cases. I think they're a fascinating class of drugs. And there's so many stories about opioids that I can tell you, but I will save that for another day. Opioids, oh, people who use opioids chronically develop tolerance. And so it is astonishing at the high levels of an opioid that somebody could have in their system and appear completely fine. Fill in the blank here oxycodone, hydrocodone, you know, what heroin, well, really we're measuring heroin metabolites like morphine. So we can't just say, oh, at this number, this person would be impaired because we don't have those kind of data. We have those kind of data for alcohol, but we don't have those kind of data for most drugs. So in summary, what can drug levels tell you? They don't always tell us enough on their own. That's why I say the more information you have, the better for your cases to share with a toxicologist should you be working in conjunction with one on one of your cases. And so it's telling us we have a drug level, you know, provided we're not dealing with a um, screening test, we have a level. So we're looking at likely a confirmatory test. That person used that drug some point in time. But a lot of times the big questions, when and how much cannot be answered because our predictive value of drug levels correlating with impairment or correlating with signs and symptoms may not exist to be able to say that. So again, what can drug levels not tell you? Not a whole heck of a lot on their own a lot of times. Again, this is a big take home point for this talk today is that with the exception of alcohol, there is no widely accepted correlation between um, a concentration of a drug in the blood and impairment. Really other things really help me as a toxicologist determine if somebody was impaired to be able to take that level and piece everything together. Remember that Nancy Drew of toxicologist. So we're gonna switch gears back to alcohol for a little bit. So for a given alcohol level, Behavior and impairment will vary from person to person with alcohol. This is not referring to driving impairment. This is referring to the person who would be visibly impaired. So I do a lot of dram shop cases. So um, those are cases where, you know, somebody was at an establishment, whether it be a bar, a restaurant, club, etc., and they were served alcohol and then they leave and something bad happens. They hit a pedestrian, they hurt themselves, they get in a car accident, what have you. Then the question becomes, what's the liquor liability of the place that they just left? Were they serving somebody who was visibly intoxicated? And then in turn, was that, you know, the, the cause of, you know, the, the accident in question? 
just taking an alcohol level, again, it's that tolerance, especially in somebody who, you know, drinks on a regular basis, you know, their behavior, their appearance, their visible impairment is going to vary from person to person. There's certainly studies that say levels, uh, you know, above a certain amount, most people will be impaired. But again, we want to know that person and it doesn't, it also hinges on that person's alcohol use. There are limited data on substances that elevate breath alcohol levels. And, you know, it's interesting because at one point, you know, I did uh, an internet search to see, well, what are attorneys reading? What are attorneys reading about all of these substances that they've asked me about in terms of how they can affect breath alcohol levels? The testing has gotten much more sophisticated in terms of being able to, you know, take out of the equation, you know, certain things that may interfere. You know, at one point there was um, some inhalers that had a little bit of alcohol in it, ethanol in them. But again, somebody has to use the inhaler, have the alcohol on their breath, and then get the breathalyzer right after. They're sitting there for at least 20 minutes or so at the traffic stop, at the incident, before they get the breathalyzer. Um, or, you know, some people will say, well, what about acetone or, you know, similar ketones in people who have uncontrolled diabetes? The technology has gotten better in terms of being able to identify alcohol versus something like a ketone or an alcohol. So there's very limited data in terms of substances that actually elevate breath alcohol levels. Um, you know, there's been cases where there's, let's say, an accident and then a car fire and the person has a breathalyzer test done at the scene and there's, you know, smoke and there's fire and there's, you know, volatile chemicals in the air. You know, how are those affecting the, bre the breathalyzer testing? That's a different story and that's on, on a case by case basis. The blood levels, those will give us the true story. And again, what are we looking for? Whole blood alcohol levels. If you have a serum level, it's not a bad thing, but don't take it and run with it. Make sure you take into account that it's approximately 15% higher than a whole blood alcohol level. So I mentioned false positives already. I mentioned PCP as a common false positive. So let's switch to false negatives for a moment before we get into false positives again. I like to circle back to concepts. So we will circle back to false positives in a moment. So False negatives. What is a false negative? That means somebody actually has the drug or class of drugs in their system, but they come up negative. Well, there's a few reasons for that. One, they may have not reached the minimum detection level. And the minimum detection level is often there on the, the laboratory analysis sheet. Um, it might not be clear what it is in terms of what are these numbers that, that I see here? Does that mean that's the maximum? Does that mean that that's the amount that they're intoxicated if they're above that? If you can identify that it's the minimum detection level, let's say the minimum detection level is 15 nanograms per milliliter. If that person has 14 nanograms per milliliter in their system, they'll come up negative. So really, the, I should put false negatives in quotes because they do have the drug in their system, right? But truly, the laboratory assay is working as it's supposed to. It's giving them a negative because it didn't reach the minimum detection level. And we have these minimum detection levels set so we don't end up with extraneous results, extraneous substances affecting results. In other words, you know, passive inhalation of marijuana or cocaine smoke or, you know, poppy seeds, which I'll talk about in a little bit in terms of the poppy seed, uh, you know, story with opioids. Um, let's start with benzodiazepines being a very common class when it comes to false negatives. So benzodiazepines are things like Valium or Xanax, Ativan, these are all brand names. Benzodiazepines, uh, we'll get to that in the later part of the program in terms of how they work, but those are just some examples. They're basically tranquilizers used for different medical conditions. But not all benzodiazepines have the same structure, and the drug screens that are looking for benzodiazepines may be looking for a component of structure that not all benzodiazepines even have, right? 
they, they may be a little bit different from one another depending on what subclass they're in. Um, so a negative toxicology report doesn't mean there were no drugs in the system. A negative toxicology report means that there were no drugs in the system that were able to be detected, either because of the minimum detection level or because of uh, the structure of the drug. Then there's opiates. So we use the terms opiates and opioids interchangeably, and that's accepted, except when we're talking about drug testing. And that's because to understand what the difference between opiates and opioids is will tell you what your results mean. So opiates are um, those drugs that are naturally derived from the opium poppy plant. So things like morphine, codeine, and there's some, you know, semi-synthetic drugs out there like heroin um, is not derived from the opium poppy plant, but it does metabolize break down into morphine as one of the metabolites. So depending on the amount, it actually might give a positive opiate screen. So opiates, natural. Opioids, man-made or semi-man-made, meaning synthetic or semi-synthetic. So if you have a drug screen that's only looking for opiates and you're wondering why the person who's on oxycodone doesn't show up positive for opiates, because they're not looking for it. Oxycodone is an opioid. Now, sometimes there's cross-reactivity, like I said, with something like heroin, but keep in mind, know what your test is capable of, know what your test is looking for. And then finally, amphetamines. Amphetamines you're gonna see on the, this false negative list and also the top three false positive list. So when Molly and ecstasy first hit the streets, I've been in toxicology a long time, so that, that was quite a long time ago, but when they, those drugs are first hitting the streets, you know, patients were coming into emergency departments, you know, reporting that they had bought amphetamine off the street and they had the classic toxidrome, meaning the picture clinically was all amphetamines. They were showing up negative for amphetamines on their toxicology screen. So why was that? Because we didn't have an assay yet for these. We didn't, we, you know, don't exactly keep up on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of having assays for every street drug out there. So those people were coming up false negative. But again, it's a false negative, you know, in quotes, because the test didn't have a capability of picking up those designer amphetamines yet. Then, as I promised, more, a little bit more about false positives. And just to reinforce the point, false negatives and false positives happen with drug screens, not with drug actual confirmatory tests. So amphetamines here on false positive. So what's an example of an amphetamine false positive? Um, not quite as many false positives as a PCP with fencycline, but enough. So let's say last night I took a Sudafed. So like the original formulation Sudafed, the pseudoephedrine for my stuffy nose last night. Depending on the toxicology test, I could show up positive for amphetamines. Is pseudoephedrine an amphetamine? No, it's not an amphetamine. Is it used to make methamphetamine? Yes, but that's another point. So depend, now when I say depending on the test, just like there's different brands of drugs, there's different brands of cars, there's different brands of shampoos, right? There's different brands of drug tests also, right? It's not a one company makes all drug tests. So drug tests are made by different manufacturers and depending on the manufacturer, the assay may have a propensity for certain false positives that others don't. It's all in the science behind that particular manufacturer's drug test. How to know these things? You could contact the manufacturer if you even know the manufacturer of the drug test and see is there a known false positive for amphetamine involving whatever drug is in question. False positives for morphine and codeine. Again, there can be some cross reaction with opioids like a heroin because of the fact that heroin has morphine as one of its two major metabolites. And this is where I'll share a little bit about the poppy seed bagel issue. Um, and so with poppy seeds being from the opium poppy plant, it makes sense that one would think, oh, well, if I ate a poppy seed bagel for breakfast, that could make me come up positive for um, an opiate for morphine, right? Well, the 
poppy seeds, first of all, themselves are not solid little pieces of opiate. They can have the milky sap from the opium poppy plant, therefore presenting the body with opiate. However, for baking purposes, and I'm not a baker, this is what I have been told, uh, I'm a toxicologist, not a baker, is that poppy seeds have a special procedure for being washed and purified, et cetera, before you, being used for baked goods. Now, is it perfect? Apparently not. Is it going to take one poppy seed bagel, one poppy seed muffin, one poppy seed roll, you decide what you want to use an example of to give somebody a positive result for an opiate like morphine? No. So let's go over that one more time. You know, the client that says, I don't use drugs. I had a poppy seed bagel for breakfast. That's why I came up positive. No, for two reasons. One, the dose makes the poison, but the dose also makes the toxicology test. That's why we have minimum detection levels. There's not going to be, even if there was, you know, the worst job in the world done on those poppy seeds in terms of preparation for baking, there's not going to be enough opiate on there to, to trip a test, right? Um, and number two, it would take so many of those baked goods even if there was residual opiate on there to elevate that test. Now, this is not to say that, because I have had questions about like poppy seed tea. Okay, now we're getting into a whole different category. In fact, there's been deaths from the poppy seed tea that people are using, you know, non-food grade poppy seeds to brew tea for whatever purposes they're interested in. And they are actually then having enough to have an opiate screen. But the poppy seed bagel story does not hold water. And then finally, PCP, I already mentioned dextromethorphan, ibuprofen, uh, lamotrigine, which is a uh, lamictal and anti-seizure drug, three of many, many false positives for fencyclidine. So like I said in the beginning, I decided that there was common classes of drugs that I seem to encounter time and time again, not as a clinical toxicologist, but as a toxicologist working with attorneys. So I thought that these were classes that would be of interest to you just at a very high level um, to really, you know, take some points and apply them to current or future cases. So we'll start with benzodiazepines and you kind of have a head start on benzodiazepines already because I gave you some examples, you know, things like Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin, Valium. These are all benzodiazepines. And so I'm going to oversimplify this. I'm going to date myself just a little bit. But when I first started in toxicology, we used to do this lecture called uppers, downers, and all arounders. You know, in toxicology, I don't know if the same thing in law, we're always looking for catchy titles and trying to look for fun where we can get it. So that was, that was the name of the, the lecture. And so you could just imagine how that simplifies being able to classify drugs and really teaching what the drugs do to the body. So benzodiazepines are downers. So what are downers? They slow down the nervous system, the central nervous system in the body. They relax the body. They can decrease alertness. They can decrease reaction time. They can cause drowsiness. Some of them even have amnesic effects. So they're used for you know, preoperative sedation, for example. And so they might be used as a sleep aid, they might be used for anti-anxiety, they might be used for seizure disorder, they might be used for, like I said, pre-op sedation. And so here's the question, this all will lead into one another. Do they interact with alcohol? Well, as much as you've seen people using alcohol and becoming intoxicated, they first have this euphoric state but it's a downer. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. You get that phase where there's the euphoria, but it is in essence a CNS depressant, it's a downer. So when you have two drugs, remember alcohol is a drug, when you have two drugs that do the same thing, they intensify the effect of one another to some extent. So a downer and a downer, yes. Interaction with alcohol, benzodiazepines. Are they detectable on a toxicology screen? We went over that a little bit in terms of the false negative examples. Again, it depends on what structure the toxicology screen is looking for in this particular class of drugs. Are benzodiazepine levels useful? I'm gonna to cut to the chase and tell you on each one of these drug classes, the drugs 
the drug levels alone are not going to be very helpful for us. Um, so we have a confirmatory test, we have a drug level, and an attorney wants to know, was this person impaired? Again, you already know the answer to this question. We need more information. Great starting point, need that level, but it's not alcohol where we just take the level, go to a handy dandy chart and say, yes, that person was impaired while driving because of that level. So each one of these drugs, drug classes, the levels have, have some use, but they're not useful in isolation. Opiates, we went over opiates. Again, I'd say we come full circle to all these just to have some take home points. So things that fall into the opiate category, things like morphine and codeine. And, you know, we're all familiar with them to be used for pain. They may be used for cough suppressant, cough suppression, and they also are downers. So they certainly interact with alcohol. And Depending on the toxicology screen, remember, know what the screen's capabilities are. Um, they may be detectable, they may not be detectable. Um, and so the levels, again, are, are a start, but in isolation are not necessarily useful. Antidepressants, when, when I first started as an undergraduate in my pharmacy program, there was only a few classes of antidepressants. As the years went on, decades went on, I should say, we expanded our knowledge in terms of um, depression and the neurotransmitters that are involved in depression and what can make people feel better. So we've expanded our armamentarium in terms of drug classes that function as antidepressants. So this is a very broad category, but I'll give you some examples. So things like Prozac or Zoloft or Paxil, those are all selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. They are antidepressants. They are affecting neurotransmitters in the brain, specifically neuro, um, excuse me, specifically serotonin. And so those particular drugs, so in that class of the SSRI, can interact with alcohol and they alone can cause impairment, especially when someone is new to the drug. Now, does that mean that someone who started on Zoloft can never drive safely again? Of course not. But it's not that they start taking Zoloft today and then, you know, go drive, you know, home from work tonight. I mean, they do cause some impairment, but there is some degree of um, tolerance that develops for that. But not with the interaction with alcohol. Combining that particular class of antidepressants with alcohol is problematic. Um, I bring up the SSRIs not only for the interaction with alcohol, but also the impairment that they can cause on their own. And so there's many other classes of antidepressants, but that was just one example. Now, are they detectable on a toxicology screen? Most of the time, a toxicology screen is just looking for um, what we would consider, you know, common drugs of abuse. So cocaine, uh, opiates, opioids, marijuana, PCP, et cetera. Um, sometimes we find tricyclic antidepressants. That's one of those old classes of antidepressants from back when I was in pharmacy school, my undergrad program, because those are so deadly in overdose that we want to know in the clinical world if somebody has those in their system. That's just an aside. Stimulants, the classic example is stimulants, cocaine, amphetamines. They speed everything up. They are uppers. Do they interact with alcohol? Um, they don't interact with alcohol, but they don't offset the effects of alcohol. So if you're thinking, oh, if somebody's drinking, but they're using um, an amphetamine or they're using cocaine, does one kind of cancel the other out just because they have opposite effects? And that is not the case. Depending on the stimulant, they may be um, detectable on toxicology screen. This is the first time I'm mentioning cocaine in the talk, but um, other than the passive inhalation of cocaine smoke for crack, but um, are they detectable on a tox screen? For cocaine, there are no false positives for cocaine. I've been presented with a lot of different scenarios. Cocaine is a very unique structure. Actually, we're typically not looking for cocaine. We're looking for 
benzylecamine. For those of you who kind of picture in your mind any drug testing results that you've seen, benzylecamine is a major metabolite, inactive metabolite of cocaine that sticks around longer. So that's more helpful for us because cocaine in its parent compound form doesn't stick around long enough for us to really be able to pick it up. So we're usually looking for its metabolite. And again, there's no false positives for cocaine. And depending on the stimulant, it should be detectable in a tox screen. I bring muscle relaxants um, in as an example, things like Flexeril, Soma, Xanaflex, they are downers. Remember, they're relaxing the muscles, but they're not only limited to the muscles that, you know, are tight, like the neck or the back or whatever the patient is using that, them for. They're relaxing from the, the brain. Right? That's where the site of action is. So they too are downers. Some are more downers than others. And so there's an issue of combining them with alcohol. Some are very sedating, even on their own, something like, let's say, Flexeril. Um, I mentioned the tox screen with muscle relaxants. We're typically not looking for muscle relaxants, but I will mention that Flexeril again, um, the generic name is cyclobenzaprine, that Flexeril can give a false positive for tricyclic antidepressants. I actually did have a case where that came into question. I don't hear a lot about tricyclic antidepressants in my life as a expert witness, more in my life as a clinical toxicologist, but sometimes that will come up. So in other words, if you do see a positive result for a tricyclic antidepressant, if they're looking for that on a toxicology screen, see if the person is on Flexeril. And then the final class, this is a broad class, but I just want to go over this briefly, cold medications antihistamines, decongestant, there's a whole aisle dedicated to this in the pharmacy. It's a very broad category. The take home message from this class is that anything that makes you drowsy, so we're thinking Benadryl, other antihistamines, can interact with alcohol and can cause impairment. And so I also will mention this class because some of these cold medications can show up as false positives on toxicology screens. So I mentioned the pseudoephedrine showing up as a false positive for amphetamines. There's also the antihistamine bromfenaramine, which can give a false positive for amphetamines, as well as a over-the-counter nasal inhaler that depending on the amphetamine test can also show up for an amphetamine. Um, I'm going to go to the case examples because we've already talked enough about these drugs. And again, these could be talks in themselves for an hour each. So these are actual cases. I've stripped them down to be, of course, unidentifiable. And also once I'm done with a case and the attorney's given the green light to you know, close the file, I destroy all the records or return that records to the attorney. So I'm doing all this from memory. So they're short, sweet, and to the point. 52-year-old gentleman injured while on the job. He, they did drug testing on him, and his initial testing revealed a positive urine drug screen for THC. That's the parent compound for marijuana, tetrahydrocannabinol. Cutoff value was 50 nanograms per milliliter. Cutoff value was they couldn't measure under that amount. Confirmatory testing mass spectrometry. Remember I said the one abbreviation that can clue you in that it's a confirmatory test is MS. Well, here it is. 204 nanograms per milliliter with a cutoff. It's another way of saying minimum detection level of 15 nanograms per milliliter. And of course, the question posed to me was, this was this gentleman impaired while he was at work and injured? Two opposing experts, neither one of them were toxicologists. I don't remember what their specialty was. They weren't toxicologists. They were both physicians. Both of them said, based on these levels alone, that because the 204 was so much higher than the 15 nanograms per milliliter, he was clearly impaired. And you're all shaking your head. Hopefully, you're all shaking your head saying, no, no, no. The minimum detection level has nothing to do with impairment. 204 nanograms per milliliter is what the amount of THC was in his blood. But I alluded to when I spoke about the breath testing device for marijuana, 
is we don't have data that correlates blood levels with impairment with this drug for many reasons, especially if it's someone who's using chronically. So that doesn't tell me when he used it, doesn't tell me how much he used. And any of the other information that I was presented with by the attorney did not tell me that he was impaired. So there was no um, evidence based on the facts of the case that were available to any of us that said he was impaired. So, you know, the opposing experts, two of them, just went by that number and said he was impaired. There were no facts in this case that indicated he was impaired whatsoever. Doesn't mean he wasn't, but the facts of the case did not support that. Um, preschool age child had a positive PCP result on a urine drug test. Now, this is a little bit of a sticky situation because it was at um, a parent's house, at the father's house, happened to come into the emergency department because of excessive uncontrolled vomiting. They did a drug screen for whatever reason. I don't recall what the clinical decision was, why they did a drug screen on this child. Drug screen. Patient came up with a positive PCP result and doctor was shocked. Your ER doc was shocked. I haven't seen that in years. I see that all the time. I don't know the last time I've ever seen a true positive for PCP. We get a confirmatory test. I don't remember ever getting a, a true positive. Be this as it may, be it as it may, this definitely stirred up some questions. And I don't know why they didn't do a confirmatory test. I wish I had the answer to that question because that would have solved it right there. But then, you know, Child Protective Services slash social work was called because of this result. And you're all probably hopefully shaking your head again saying, why didn't they just get a confirmatory test, right? That's a great question. 12-year-old boy with a positive THC result on a urine drug test, right? This is marijuana. Also had a confirmatory test. Okay, so we've got the confirmatory test this time. Mom reports she's been giving the child cannabidiol oil, CBD oil for his uncontrolled seizure disorder. This case was prior to the prescription version of cannabidiol being available, by the way. So she's using like an over-the-counter, you know, corner herbal mart type product. Where was the THC coming from? Well, cannabidiol should not have THC in it. Doesn't mean it can't though. So was the THC from another source or was it a contaminant, which is possible, these, these products are not regulated by the FDA. They don't, um, they're not mandatory to you know, have uh, regular testing done for purity or quality. That would have solved the issue if this was if this product was tested and to see if it actually had contaminated uh, if it was contaminated with THC because cannabidiol is not THC and it should not produce a positive THC result. Final example case example: forty two year old woman tested at work comes up positive cocaine. They do a urine drug screen. You already know there's no false positives for cocaine. The confirmatory test also reveals that metabolite I mentioned for cocaine, benzyl eponine. So she's, she's got cocaine and there's no false positive cocaine. But her explanation was her sexual partner uses cocaine, but she does not. Remember those minimum detection levels? This is another example of why we have that. Is cocaine found in sexual fluids? Sure, it can be. Is it found in a sufficient amount that if it's transferred to a partner that that partner would then have a positive result for cocaine? No. Again, that's what those minimum detection levels are for. So I want to just take um, a moment to thank everyone for attending today's program. Um, I want to make sure that I was able to answer any questions, but I think we are out of time. Um, and I apologize for that. So if anyone would like their questions answered um, outside of today's talk, please feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to, to answer them. Again, thank you for your attention and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much, Dr. Muller. It was very informative and you really hit several areas uh, uh, crossing over into different areas of the law. And I, I do see a couple of questions have come in. And since we're over time, I, I do invite you to reach out to Dr. Muller so that she can share her advice on it. I want to thank our sponsors. And I also want to thank both sections, family law section and the litigation section for putting this on. And thank you again, Dr. Muller. It was very informative. Have a good day. Thank you as well.